Welcome everybody. This is my second video about 8-bit computer internals. So this video will be pretty technical. If you haven't seen the first part, I'll link it here because it helps to understand this one. I've been hesitating what to use as an example. Finally, I choose Nebula 2 because it was used to teach digital technology. So what do we have here on the PCB? First of all, we have a CPU, which is a Z80 clone. But this is the East German variant. On the picture, the red socket is where you can plug in the app room. And additionally, we have two memories. These two modules gives us uh, one kilobyte of memory. And there is this crystal. So this is 5000 kilohertz, so 5 megahertz. This is responsible for the clock signal for the whole computer. There are two additional circuits. Those are I.O. circuits from the Z80 series. I won't talk about those, but they are there. To be able to enter the code, we have a keyboard where we can enter the code in hex. And there is these LED displays. <laughs> it's OK, let's call it displays, uh, where you can see uh, the state of the CPU or the code. So let's start with the CPU. Z80 was a very popular CPU and this drawing shows the pins of the CPU and they are pretty well grouped together. So what kind of groups do we have? Sometimes instead of group, I will talk about bus. Bus is a group of the pins working on the same thing. So for example, uh, address bus consists all of the address pins or data bus contains all the data pins. So first of all, what we need to get it moving, I mean the Z80 moving, of course we need to feed it, so we need firewall and the ground. Additionally, as I mentioned already, there is a clock signal. The second group is the address bus, which is from A0 to A15. It means it is 16 bit wide, that way Z80 can address 64 kilobytes. Addressing means we are selecting something from this address range. And when we select something, we are addressing some data. So we need a data bus, which is 8-bit wide. It means we have a single byte. When we're talking about 8-bit computer, it doesn't mean the data bus width, because for example, there is the 8088, which is the CPU of the first Intel PC, and it had 8-bit uh, data bus, but internally it was 16 bits, so it doesn't mean that if the data bus is 8 bit wide, this is an 8 bit computer. But in this case, Z80 is an 8 bit computer with a 8 bit wide data bus. The next group with blue contains control pins. These pins are necessary to control the data input and output beside the address and the data bus. I will talk about all the pins one by one because they are quite important. So on the right side, there is the read, write, memory request. Memory request is active only when we are reading or writing memory. There is the IO request. This is active when we are addressing some IO. So for example, I mentioned those two uh, additional circuits. This is the signal which is used when we are selecting those ones. There is the M1. M1 is active when the CPU is loading an instruction. And then there is the refresh. And the weight. Refresh is used for dynamic memory, so the Z80 was a good CPU because it was easy to use with dynamic memory. Right now, uh, in this board, there is no dynamic RAM, and because of that, I won't go into more details. On the left side, there is the weight, which is a quite special because this is a signal which is coming towards the CPU. So while on the right side is used by the CPU to control the bus and the addressing. The weight is used by the addressed uh, circuit to let the CPU know that it needs a little bit more time to provide an answer or store the data which is uh, sent by the CPU. Of course, there are even more pins. I won't provide details because simply those are not in use in this circuit. Halt can be used to halt the CPU, so it is an input pin. Bus request can use also to detach the Z80 from the bus and get control over the bus. For example, if you are using a DMA and the CPU can answer with the bus acknowledge when he is releasing all the stuff. 
There are two more pins, those are for interrupts, non-maskable and the normal interrupt. Those are not necessary for this small computer. I mentioned a few times that something is active. As you can see, uh, there are those small circles and also those lines on top of the signals. It means these signals are active when they are going down to zero. So those can have two states, zero and one. And when we are talking about active state, they are going down to zero. If I say it is active zero, it means the same. Okay, so we have the CPU and we try to address the memory. How does the CPU know what to address? It is quite simple. When we turn on the CPU, it is starting from zero. So zero, 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 zero. So this is in hex. So we need four hex numbers to set the 16 bit. Luckily, I have a memory map for this small computer. Sorry, it is Hungarian, but let me translate it. So it is starting with the app ROM. Why is it starting with the app ROM? As I mentioned, if you turn on the Z80, it is starting from the app ROM. So it is executing the inbuilt program. So if we have something like ZX81, it is starting the initial routine. So it is initializing the whole computer and then it is executing the basic routines. The memory is starting from 1000 and on this board, I have only a single kilobyte. As you can see, there are more memory segments and from 2000, it is repeating itself. So it means few address bus lines are not in use. So it is just simply addressing the same chips in different uh, address ranges. After Z80, let's talk about the app room. This is an obvious choice because when we are turning on this machine, this is the first one in use. This chip also has an address bus, but it has only 11 bits and there is Q0 to Q7. So this is on, on the CPU side, this is D0 and D7, so 8-bit wide data bus. We have, of course, the power and we have two additional pins. These are EP and G. Those are used to enable the app room. To be exact, EP is chip enable. Most of the time you can see on, on, on different drawings like CE and there is the G, which is output enable. Why do we need those? Simply because we have on the CPU side E11 to E15 and based on those pins, we can control these ones. So we can say when A11 to A15 is zero, this is when we are setting uh, those chip select and uh, output enable to zero and enable the chip. When chip enable is set to zero, then this is activating the, the app room. If it is inactive, then it is consuming only 132 milliwatts, but when it is active, it is using 525 milliwatts. Uh, quite a difference, right? There is this output enable. Output enable means it can drive the data bus. When it is not enabled, it is set to high impedance mode, which means it is just, let's say, disconnected from the bus. It is not driving it. So someone else can talk on the bus. It is like a teacher is selecting only one student at a time. So there is a clear communication. In the previous video, I talked about synchronous networks and this chip is kind of synchronous asynchronous mixture. But you will see why I say it is synchronous and why I say, in fact, this is coming from the CPU. Let's check out the waveforms and then we are switching to memory. And at the CPU, you will see why I'm talking about synchronous mode. When the CPU is fetching data from the app room, it is starting with a valid address. Next to the address, the CPU also set memory request and read. Based on those pins, there is an addressing circuit, which is setting an active signal towards the app room. And also the output is enabled, so it is going down to zero after a while. So the app room can talk to the bus. There is this table, you can see that it's around 350 nanoseconds. The data is appearing on the output. After the controlling signals are going from active zero to one, the data will disappear from the bus. So the CPU is sampling the, the data bus before that. So somewhere around where the G and EP is going up. And then it can also change the address on the address bus. If you are checking the RAM read cycle timing, it is very, very similar. The only difference, there is no EP and G, but there is just a single chip select. So there is the address 
and then the chip select is going active zero and after y so tcx there is the data on the bus when the chip select is going up the address can be changed and also the data is disappearing from the bus the ROM can be also written but the difference is not that big we need of course the address we need the chip select but at the same time the write enable is going active as well so it means we are writing the memory not reading in this case the cpu is putting the data on the bus and the memory cell is written when the chip select and write enable is going from zero to one as you can see here is an edge and the write itself is triggered by this edge so this is a synchronous write and now let's check out how it looks like from the Z80 side. The Z80 is working synchronously. There is a clock signal and one clock cycle takes from one rising edge to the other rising edge. The CPU cycle takes more than one clock signal. So for example here, the memory read cycle takes three clocks. It is working based on the edges. So for example, the falling edge of the T1, so the first clock signal, or the rising edge in T3. So let's check out how the memory read cycle works. After the first rising edge in T1, the CPU put a valid address to the address bus. In the same T1, on the falling edge, the memory request and the read, so both of them are going to an active state, so they are going down to zero. After that, the CPU is waiting for the memory, so the memory is putting valid data on the data bus. There is one more signal, this is the wait. If it is active in T2, then there is an extra clock cycle inserted between T2 and T3. What does it mean? If the memory is not fast enough, it can delay the read on the CPU. Of course, it cannot be delayed indefinitely, but it is not a problem to delay with one, two or even three wait states. If we are talking about uh, modern memories, so for example DDR4 or DDR5, then this is the wait state we are talking about. Of course, there the memory read and write cycles are not that simple, but there is also a kind of wait signal. What is important, the memory should be fast enough, so the data, the valid data, should be on the data bus in T3 falling edge. This is the point where the CPU is sampling the data bus and storing the data internally. After that, the memory request and the read are going back to inactive state. At the end of the T3, the CPU can change the address to the next one. The memory write cycle is really similar. So at the beginning of T1, there is the memory address on the bus. Also, the memory request is going down at the first folding edge, so it is going to active. But in this case, the read signal will never be active because we are writing the memory. Also, as we are writing, the CPU is putting the data on the data bus. At T2 falling edge, the write is going to active. This is the point, similar to the read cycle, where the memory can add a wait state to the whole process. And in T3, so at T3 falling edge is the point where the memory should store the data. So the memory should read the data bus and store it internally. Let me refer back to the memory write cycle timing. Those two red columns are the same. The only difference on the CPU side, we have memory request and write, while we have chip select and write enable on the memory side. It means we need a circuit which is somehow translating the signals of the CPU towards the memory, so towards the ROM and the ROM. In case of Nebulo 2, it is quite simple. In this case, this is managed by few TTLICs. So first of all, there is this 74S188, which is responsible for the chip select signals. As input signals, first of all, it is using A10, 11, 12, and 15. If you remember the memory web, here we miss A14 and A13, this is the reason behind the repeated memory map. The memory request is connected to A0 and there is a little bit of kind of cheat. So the read and the write is going to a NOR gate and this is connected to the enable. What does it mean? If both the read and the write are set to 1, so they are inactive, 
In this case, the IC is not enabled, so IC15 is not driving any of those chip selects. And there are those resistors, they are pulling up the inputs of the memory ICs, so both the ROMs and ROMs, to one. In this case, none of those will be active. As you can see, the Nebula 2 is very simple, but of course, a real 8 bit computer has much more components. As a good example, TRS80 is coming into my mind, much more complex, and this is just a little part of it. But what is important, this is built mainly from asynchronous gates. But the delays are not causing any kind of issue. Here I try to refer back to the previous video and the hazard, because the synchronous way how the CPU and the memories are working together and using falling and raising edges to control sampling of the bus. As I'm reaching end of this video, let me summarize it. So we have the Z80 CPU, it has an address bus, which is 16 bits wide, so it can address 64 kilobytes. There is the data bus, which is 8 bit wide, and there are additional pins controlling the bus, so deciding if it is memory or IO request, and if we are talking about read or write. The CPU is working in a synchronous way, so it is controlled by a clock signal. The control signals and data input output is synchronized to rising and falling edges. And these control signals are deciding if we are talking about write, read, and if it is happening towards an IO, or in this case, these are happening towards the memory. There is also the wait signal, which can be used in case the memory is slow compared to the CPU, so there is more time for the memory to read or write the data. In the next video, I plan to talk about design philosophies and limitations like price, memory size, video resolution, and other things. I hope you find this small insight useful and you will join me for the next one. I wish you a nice day. Goodbye.